probably dying of asphyxiation. He was yes. arching back its head, trying to get air, most likely. Now, again, it's not just the dinosaurs. It's birds, all the other dinosaurs. So you find them in one of two ways. Either they're ripped apart and dismembered, or they exhibit the death pose. Marvelous. That's a statement that has not been made on this program, and mm -hmm. probably there are many scholars watching the program mm -hmm. who are not aware of this. Mm -hmm. Major statement. Now, Marvelous. I wonder if you could do me a favor and pass me that fossil Kichasaurus right there, because I've got another one here. Now, this comes from the Big Valley Creation Science Museum in Alberta, Canada. I've now gotten to study five different Kichasauruses. Notice the similarities. These are not the same fossil. But you notice the similarities? Yes. Even the marine reptiles, all five of them had their head bent to the side as far as possible. They are in Incredible. death throes. Death throes in the process of dying, but mm -hmm. they were caught and entombed mm -hmm. in the process of dying. Yes, and some suggest this was from drying tendons. Well, there's a lack of consistency. It doesn't line up. No, you, you can't move all of that uh, cover. Uh, no. Overburden. Uh, no. And uh, a lot of these dinosaurs, for instance, the legs, are some are tucked up. The one beside it, some are not. Sometimes the arms are tucked up. Sometimes they are like this, as though they were attempting to swim out of mud or yes. something. Buried in the process. Quite a tremendous statement. Mm -hmm. Ian, every time I have you on the program, time just flies so rapidly. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> I noticed some special fossils. Oh, you noticed these, did you? Uh, in fact, I was eyeing these because for years I've been trying to get a, a fossil like this. Tell me. Uh, well, here, what why, do you why don't you hold that one right there? Oh, I'll be glad to. Okay. Mm. <laughs> these are uh, ammonites or yes. nautiloids, depending on, on uh, the species and whatnot. Named because of the curl horn like. <coughs> the curl horn like uh, contour. Right, exactly. Now, these, uh, I'm a robotics engineer by trade. Now, I, a number of years ago, built uh, a series of submarine robots. I learned the hard way what worked and what didn't. One of the first things I learned was that you need ballast tanks which are solid and spherical. If they're not solid, they're compressible and their buoyancy will change with depth. Yes. That's a bad thing for a submarine. Yes. <laughs> because the moment it starts to sink, it will rocket to the bottom. And the moment it starts to float, it will rocket to the top. <laughs> you can't control it. These are fascinating living submarines. And I brought these all the way from Tucson, Arizona. And these are yours for your oh, museum, by Ian, the way. Ian, marvelous, marvelous. Mm -hmm. I, I have, of course, excavated many, many ammonites mm -hmm. and have studied ammonites. But this has very distinctive contour. Mm -hmm. Would you tell the audience what that little organ is? That's really important. Now, that's another part of the idea, the concept of a building a submarine. By the way, I sunk about three or four before I got uh, it right. I, I understand. Uh, apparently, these guys got it right the first time, or else the evolution would have died with them. Yes. This is the siphuncle. It is yes. essentially a blood vessel, for lack of a better term, and it connects all of these solid spherical chambers. Geez, somebody figured out how to build a submarine. And <laughs> as it makes the connection, it actually transfers gases. Yes. In order for it to submerge yep. or to elevate <laughs> up near the top, and that occurs very slowly. Yes, it can either fill them with water or it can fill them with gas. Or it can fill it part way and achieve what we call neutral buoyancy. Which, of course, is what, what you want. Incredible design. Absolutely. Now, we have only moments left in the program, mm -hmm. but now this is only partial because the creature itself, now, this was the chamber mm -hmm. in which he lived. There was a hood over this, yes. and the creature actually lived in this compartment, would come out with his tentacles. Describe that briefly for us, please. Yeah, that was, it was a nifty little creature squid-like and it would uh, live in that chamber and hang out the back here and it has a little tube and it would actually squish the water out the back it yes. would take in water and that was how it moved along that was its propulsion system if you will <laughs> marvelous living living submarines now in these closing moments you can see that we have so much to talk about and we've only scratched the surface it's such a 
pleasure to have Professor Juby with us today and quite often on the program. But now, I, Ian, I believe uh, you have led us to the conclusion that these living systems, the once living systems, did not arrive by evolutionary development. We started with the DNA. Everything had to be intact. There is no way for this to develop. Now, we may have various forms of this that work better. Some of us work better than others. Mm -hmm. uh, we each have particular features uh, that are superior or inferior. And that's the case of all living systems. But the entire system has to be intact. We talked about an intermediate link. And what used to be considered an intermediate link is not an intermediate link between the reptiles and the birds. It is its own special bird. Mm -hmm. Now, in your opinion, does that point to evolution or creation? Well, there is only one option. When you have a series of complex systems that uh, have to be in place at the same time functioning together or the creature perishes, there is only one option. Design. Design. And design clearly points to a designer. To a designer. That is the point of the program. We're taking the evidence at face value. We're taking the correlation of evidence at composite value. And it's obvious that there's design that requires a designer. There's creation that requires a creator. Would you like to know that creator? You can. He sent his son to walk with us. He lived among us spoke to us, instructed us, went to the cross, died for us. They buried him. He arose from the dead. He's alive at this moment, asking entrance into your heart. Would you pray this simple prayer? Just pray it with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. Come into my heart right now. I open my heart's door to you. Come in and live and save me. Cover me with your blood. I will serve you with all my heart. And one day, my friend, if you prayed that prayer, you'll meet the creator of all the design. Creation in the 21st century has been sponsored by Trinity Broadcasting Network. And only with your love gift of support can this program stay on the air. So write to Creation in the 21st Century, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Information like you've received today is available at the Creation Evidence Museum. In printed form, in videos, we even have a coloring book for the kids. Just call or write us at Creation Evidence Museum, P.O. Box 309, Glen Rose, Texas, 76043, area code 254-897-3200, or check us out on the web, creationevidence.org.